Hello fellow classmates and Dr. Crumb. Uh, I'm Tabitha Hughes and this week in our video discussion I'm going to be discussing uh, the controversy in the 1920s of fundamentalism versus modernism and the event that I chose to encapsulate this controversy was the Scopes trial uh, of 1925. So, a brief introduction to the controversy that arose in the 1920s of fundamentalism versus modernism. Um, it really arose in response to the post-World War I era. Um, during that time, there were a lot of advancements in science, a lot of changes in theological philosophy, um, and a lot of disillusionment from um, left over from the war. And so what you ended up with was the perfect storm of events coming together in America to create this great schism or chasm um, in religion and religious thought. Essentially, um, modernist tended to, or modern Christians, there were two kind of modernists. You had modernists in society who embraced, of course, change, um, scientific discoveries, new philosophical thought. Um, and then you had modernist Christians who, kind of in the same vein, were beginning to question whether the Bible could be taken literally. They were beginning to, were beginning to examine the scripture a little more um, <clears throat> with scrutiny. Um, also trying to align or look at the Bible through the lens of science, especially um, in light of some of the thought that began to arise in Germany and in the German universities. Um, <clears throat> and so modernism or Christian modernists sought to basically embrace society. They, many of them were proponents of the social gospel where they felt the church's uh, role was to basically create this moral utopian society um, where the church does good, you know, good deeds and good works and influences individuals' moral character. And as individuals become more uh, socially aware and morally aware of themselves, then of course society will become better and, and doing God's work to ensure that. Now, the opposite end of the spectrum that arose out of all this was, of course, the fundamentalist backlash. Now, fundamentalists or fundamentalism basically means a return to the fundamentals of Christianity. And fundamentalists were, I would like, for, for Harry Potter references, the purebloods. Um, they were very much um, out of that old Calvinist, Protestant um, background in which the Bible is to ta be taken as divine, as authoritative, um, as literal, no room for interpretation. Um, you know, the role of the church was the salvation of souls. And as a result of the salvation of souls, then people would do good and, and help others. And the social aspect would come out of the moral responsibility and the of the people who had been converted and won for Christ. So you have these these two very strong-willed factions operating within America in the post-World War I period, and they were clashing heads both in the religion or the religious arena and then, of course, in the social and the political arenas as well. For example, um, the Baptist group was one of these that kind of struggled and being a Southerner and growing up in the Southern Baptist region, um, there was a quote that stood out in the article um, on FDR that really grabbed my attention. First of all, the title of the article grabbed my attention, um, FDR is the Antichrist. But it was talking about um, fundamentalism and how it really took a while to, to take hold in the South, which kind of um, surprised me and, and prompted me to think because growing up Southern Baptist, it's always just been a part of my heritage, this fundamental belief. The quote says this, contrary to long held popular misconceptions, fundamentalism thrived in predominantly, but not exclusively, Northern and Western urban areas. 
New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, and Seattle. Areas where the differences between the faithful and the broader culture was most pronounced. Meanwhile, fundamentalists had a harder time building a distinctive movement in culturally conservative areas, such as the rural North and much of the South, where the differences between their faith and ethics and the broader community remain less obvious. In such places, conservative Christians fit quite comfortably within existing, established, and traditional churches. And this is the, the line that kind of stood out. They generally felt little need to call their communities back to the fundamentals of the Christian faith. They had never left them. So that was interesting to me because, of course, when I think of fundamentalism, I think of the South, Southern Baptist Convention. Um, so that was interesting. So into this controversy steps the, the issue of evolution. Now, this theory came about as the result of the work of Charles Darwin, a scientist who spent a good part of the early to mid-1830s traveling around the world and observing different animal species. Uh, he's noted for his work with finches and um, on the Galapagos Islands. And from his work, he discerned or theorized that all living creatures evolve, um, and they evolve from lesser forms. Now, of course... He then applied that to, or insinuated, that that also applied to man. Now, being in this already charged environment, fundamentalists took great um, offense to a theory such as that. And so it became a battle cry for which they were ready to kind of die on that hill for, to go to war against modernists. Um particularly as it pertained to evolution being taught in public schools. Um, so fundamentalists believed inherently that uh, the creation of man was divine. It happened exactly like it said in the Bible. There was Adam and there was Eve and then poof, there was creation. And um, that man was not evolved from a lesser being. So into that came this young teacher, John Scopes, in 1925 um, in Dayton, Tennessee. It's interesting because, um, according to a couple of articles that I found this week, and in the research of the reading, John Scopes really was kind of put up to being a part of this case. So a little backstory. Um, the Tennessee uh, state legislator, legislature, excuse me, had passed basically a ban on teaching evolution in public schools. One of the articles this week that I read was an article um, about J.W. Butler, and he was he was the Tennessee legislator legislator that was responsible for the Butler bill, which was basically the bill that outlawed teaching evolution. In public schools and this was what he said about the law he said Tennessee law does not permit the Bible to be taught in its public schools nor does it allow any system of religion to be taught but the Bible can be read without comment and as the Tennessee law does not permit a doctrine to be taught the purpose of which would be to make Christians then I maintain that it is not fair to the people who pay the taxes to support the schools to be forced where they will be taught a doctrine which causes them to become infidels and have no respect for Christianity. This, I maintain, is what the teaching of evolution does for our children. So, in Butler's opinion, the law was almost an equalizer. If, if the Bible was not going to be allowed to be taught in schools, then neither was evolution. Because taxpayers shouldn't have to pay for a doctrine to be taught if it wasn't going to be done so equally. Well, when this law was passed, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, immediately decided they were going to test this law. And so they put out advertisements looking for teachers um, who would volunteer basically to be the guinea pig to go on trial. Well, some of the businessmen in Dayton, Tennessee, had the idea to put their town on the map. And so uh, a friend of John Scopes said, hey, would you be willing to be a part of this this trial? We're going to challenge this bill. So John Scopes agreed. Now, at the time, he was 
he was hired to be a mathematics teacher and a coach, but he was filling in for a biology teacher that had passed away. So he was basically substituting when this happened. Well, he was arrested. And then, of course, that gave the ACLU exactly what they needed. So basically, the nation descends on this small town. They bring in William Jennings Bryan, who, of course, we know from previous study was a fiery evangelical uh, fundamentalist to help and assist with the prosecution. And the ACLU hired Clarence Darrow, a high-profile attorney, defense attorney from Chicago, who had defended um, Leopold and Loeb, um, the... Uh, other various important cases in Chicago. So Clarence Darrow was brought in. Now Scopes himself said about the trial later after um, he was, you know, looking back on it, he uh, said that he was very impressed by Mr. Darrow um, and especially his examination of, of William Jennings Bryan. Um, but he said that Brian was a silver-tongued defender of the literal word of God, and he felt that he was essentially an orator whose dedication to fundamentalism had no reason to be doubted. Um, of Darrow, he said, he could express what I believed better than I could ever hope to do. So it wasn't as if Scopes, and he said that, I didn't know a whole lot about evolution, but I believed in the right of the teacher to be able to teach it. So, long story short, the trial commences. Um, it's a media circus, um, as can be imagined. There are farmers, press from all over the nation. There's people bringing real chimpanzees in. And so, um, it, probably the biggest blow that came out of it, Darrow put William Jennings Bryan on the stand. And in this heated cross-examination, basically got Bryan to admit that there were certain aspects of the Bible that... He couldn't literally explain. He had to kind of put a little, not spin, but adapt, adaptation on it. So, for example, a day could be a million years to God, not necessarily 24 hours. And so, of course, that had um, irrevocable, or irrevocable um, consequences for fundamentalism in the immediate um, aftermath of the Scopes trial. So... John Scopes was found guilty. Uh, took about nine minutes for the jury to do so. He was fined a hundred dollars, but that was later uh, overturned on a technicality. The law, incidentally, the Butler uh, law does still stand on the books of Tennessee, but no one has challenged it since then. So fundamentalism versus modernism. You know, are we getting back to the fundamentals and the purity of that Calvinistic Christian tradition versus do we allow for Christianity to, or Christian belief, or churches to merge a little bit of that modern science and modern thought and critical thinking about the Bible. And the Scopes trial was just one of those instances and challenges that, that really brought the controversy into full life for everyone. Thank you.